Hey everyone, I'm here today virtually with Jimmy Bogard at NDC Sydney. Welcome Jimmy, thanks for joining. Glad to be here. That's great. So I saw your talk yesterday, it was on distributed tracing with .NET. That's right, it was yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's right. You have Very a really, exciting. yeah, no, you do. You have a really great way of distilling a, what could be a complex subject into a simple and straightforward approach. So thank you for that. Yeah, of course. So I've been using your projects now for quite some time. We, we, we mentioned it briefly before, I've been using Automapper, um, I've been using uh, Mediator, and most recently I've started using Respawn. And I was wondering today if we could take an opportunity to have a bit of a look at Respawn uh, so that people who maybe haven't seen it before can understand it and see how easy it is to get up and running. Yeah, of course. Um, so I've got the, the Nuget uh, window open here for the Respawn package. And Respawn mm -hmm. is a, a project that we use a lot for integration testing. Um, so in a lot of our systems and applications, of course, we have our unit tests, but we also have a lot of integration tests because we want to make sure that the application really works from front to back. Um, mm -hmm. So even if we have tests like, you know, mock out stuff, whatever, you kind of want to make sure that everything works like, you know, full circle from the front end to the back end. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we really want to make sure that it actually has like a real database with those integration tests as well. And so mm -hmm. there are a lot of ways that you can, you know, build integration tests to have those uh, test databases. Like you can use something like SQL local DB or, you know, local mm -hmm. containers, things like that. Um, but one well, of the problems- Wait a, we, wait a second, what about, in, what about in memory? Shouldn't we just use in memory for <laughs> integration tests? Uh, for unit tests, sure. <laughs> <laughs> No, I've tried that in the past. And what inevitably happens is like we get false positives or false negatives where mm -hmm. unless it's actually hitting that that link query provider that takes that that link and, yep. and translates the SQL, it's just like, which is like the most complex code probably in the entire .NET code base is that yep. code. Um, unless that code's being exercised, then you don't really know if it's going to work in production. Um, I mean, yep. you could do some, you know, simple queries could work, but I really want to have like the utmost confidence that like this, this application is, is actually going to work. It's going to so, work exactly as you expect because this is what you're going to be using in production. It's as close as possible to what we're actually using in production exactly. Okay. Now, if you started writing more and more of these, uh, one of the things you kind of run into is that that test database, which is still running locally for us, uh, starts to get cluttered and messy. It's like all this other data that you don't really want in there because you have test runs over periods mm -hmm. of time that you don't really care about that test data. So mm -hmm. Respawn was really... Uh, re, uh, for us, just for me, it's just like scratching an itch. That's like I, I hate all this test data. Trying to triangulate what, what you know, test failed, what went wrong. I'm seeing this like you know, twenty thousand rows in my you know test user table. So yep. Respawn is all about trying to get an intelligent reset for databases and integration testing. Of course. Now there's a few like few ways people try to do this, and this is mm -hmm. I found the least the least worst way of doing it. Um, yep. So like you have some people that will say, okay, if I have an integration test hitting a database, why don't mm -hmm. we just wrap the entire test in a transaction? So yeah. when the test runs, the transaction rolls back. But if you ever try to debug those tests, uh, it is it is really hard to like look at the data for a transaction that is still in progress but gets is about to get rolled back. So it's like almost okay. impossible. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't match like what your application actually does. Whenever we're 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 built we're running an application making multiple requests. Each request is a separate transaction. So if my test mm -hmm. is in a whole transaction, that doesn't match again what my application is actually doing. So I want to make it match, I want to make it work. And so the, the naive way of doing this would be something like, um, just delete all the data from all the tables. Yep. So before my test runs, just clear all the data and you're good to go. <clears throat> yep. The problem we, we ran into pretty quickly though is that if I have a lot of tables, uh, it is hard to know the right order in which to delete the data from those tables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, my first project, we were doing like this with a lot of stuff. We actually had like yep. a, a single file that was like all of the tables in the, in the right order in a single array. And then when you yeah. had a new table, you had to put it in the right place. Like that sucked. Um, so yeah, I've thought, done that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's horrible. Yeah. Uh, so in a moment of, of clarity, uh, you know, I get one of those like every three or four years. It's like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. tables are just a, a, you know, if I look at the relationships between tables, tables are just kind of a, a link list um, yes. or graph of, of items. If I look at mm -hmm. the nodes or the tables and the edges are all the foreign key constraints. I've actually got an example of that uh, right here. 
So oh, this cool. is the Contoso University project with the uh, with the very basic schema. Right? This is just seven tables. Mm -hmm. Well, yep. I'm also using Roundhouse, so I got you know a few more. Um, yeah. So the, even like this, if I were just to look at this, like how would you, if I were to make sure I deleted the, the, these the tables in the right order, I'd have to follow the relationships and mm -hmm. and try to delete the the leaf nodes first, and then walk back up to the and then like eliminate those and walk back up. So it's really a depth first reversal of this tree tells you mm -hmm. the order in which you delete all the tables. And that's mm -hmm. all that Respawn does, is it looks at the schema of the database, just using kind mm -hmm. of standard ANSI SQL, uh, pulls out the, 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 the tables and the relationships, and mm -hmm. builds that cached list of here's the correct order to delete everything from, um, so yep. that you don't have to build that up every single time. And we okay. found that that is faster than anything else you could possibly do, like uh, disabling foreign key constraints, going mm -hmm. alphabetically and then re-enabling, that's three mm -hmm. times slower. Um, wow. Truncating tables is slower because you, you have to also uh, disable some other stuff as well. So this, yeah. where I just get that list of tables once and, yeah. and reset, it's the absolute fastest. Excellent, okay, wonderful. And so, so with, that, with that model then, it's gonna end up starting with kind of the enrollment, is it? Or will it start uh, with student? Yeah, students, uh, then adapt. Yeah, God, I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. no, no, it doesn't even matter. Just like do the yeah, maybe down here off what's assignment because it's one of those join table things, and yeah, yeah. Then it kind of works backwards and just keeps looping through there until it doesn't find still doesn't find yeah. it. And so Respawn supports multiple databases, so you had to write this for lots of different databases and work out how you could do that for lots of different databases, such as SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres, and that sort of thing. Yeah, so let's uh, why don't we take a look at the code and see how it actually actually works. Okay. So this is my integration test project. Um, so let's just look at the references real quick. So a couple mm -hmm. things I've got. I've got, of course, Respawn, um, which yeah. supports .NET Standard 2.0, so just about everything under mm -hmm. the sun. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm also using the Microsoft ASP.NET Core testing package because it lets me build like a test server with the container mm -hmm. and everything in there really quickly. Okay. Um, and so looking at one of my tests, this is, uh, this is an integration test that takes a uh, basically the in the, the web application factory from ASP.NET Core integration testing. And then inside mm -hmm. of this integration test, um, each one of these top level statements, like send this mediator message to do some operation. Um, mm -hmm. Instead of me going through the API, which I have to do HTTP client junk, this is a bit mm -hmm. easier. It's like the DTO yeah. I send down and come back up. Uh, so this, this is a full round trip transaction right here. And then yeah. down here, I have to insert in some other stuff. This is a full round trip transaction. And then finally, mm -hmm. when I assert, again, it's a full round trip transaction, just like you would see in a real application. So this integration okay. test, high degree of uh, confidence that this would actually work in real life because the test matches mm -hmm. what we would actually see in, in production. Okay. So if I dig down here into the slice fixture. Yep. I'm not letting you get any questions in, by the way. That's fine, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Okay. So uh, this is just a fixture class, like the you know X unit pattern fixture thing. So I... I'm, I'm building up the web application factory thing from the the ASP.NET Core testing project. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I'm getting a checkpoint object. And this checkpoint object is the thing from Respawn that really caches, uh, it, it both figures out the right order to delete tables in, and mm -hmm. then I can call it every time in order to reset the tables to where they need to be. And so it just queries okay. that metadata once, and then that's it. Okay, excellent. And so, so you're you new... You're newing it up there, but you haven't passed in any configuration or anything. Yeah, so you're asking about like what databases to support. Um, yeah. So I can set the uh, DB adapt. No. I thought it was a parameter here. But yes, there is. Yeah. yeah, when I've used it. Um, all I've passed it is a connection string, and it seems to figure out the rest. I don't think I've specified like SQL Server or anything along the way. Uh, that's probably correct because it's I've only ever used it for SQL Server, and I've had people yep. with PRs submit for uh, Postgres, Oracle, MySQL, uh, DB2, uh, <laughs> um, whatever. Uh, so yeah, it might be that. It might be the actual. Uh, actually, it might be this. Uh, the DB adapter. Mm. DB adapter equals. Maybe it's got a default. So we've been uh, smooth sailing with SQL yeah, Server all this DB time. Yeah, DB adapter dot. Oh, there we go. Okay. 
There it yeah, is. So I've got, so, yeah, okay, it was, it was somewhere. So the default is a <laughs> SQL Server DB adapter and those interfaces yep. are just like, what is my what is my my statement to do? Find the tables. What is my statement to do? Find the foreign key constraints. Mm-hmm. Do the things, whatever. So yeah, there's a five that supports. Um, the one okay, I've actually so that, used SQL, but the other ones are whatever. Yeah. So that's cool. Hey, can you cre- increase the font size just a little bit, just in case people can't see? And um, so we've got five there that are supported. And obviously, if someone else wants to see support for a different database, then they should submit a pull request to the repo. Yeah, and it just underneath the coverage uses the standard. Um, uh, like ADO.NET SQL client stuff that's been in mm-hmm. .NET and .NET Core forever. Um, yep. So it doesn't require like any other specific packages or whatever. Okay, okay so once I've got this checkpoint, uh, now I need to actually use it. So I've got a method down here to reset a checkpoint. Down here it is. So mm-hmm. I call checkpoint.reset. And mm-hmm. I give it either a connection string or a DB connection, uh, mm-hmm. whatever the one makes sense for you. And mm-hmm. uh, at that point, it will, the first time you use it, query the schema, build up the list of tables. And then every mm-hmm. subsequent time, it'll just use that cache list of tables and just do the delete statement for whatever database you're looking at. So Postgres okay. is slightly different uh, than SQL mm-hmm. Server, slightly different than MySQL. They're very close, but mm-hmm. just does it every single time. Okay. When does it do it? Ah, so that depends. Um, and yep. when you want that to happen. So mm-hmm. we, I have done it to where every single test resets its database before it runs. Mm-hmm. And you can do that, but that does pose the problem of if you, have, if you want to have tests run in parallel, then one mm-hmm. test can be resetting the database while the other one's trying yep. to insert something in. Um, yeah. So you can turn parallelization off but now mm-hmm. your already slow tests are going to be like really slow because uh, mm-hmm. it just runs you know, sequential. So what I yep. wound up doing is uh, having my test just in it, just reset at the beginning of each test run. So that's yep. more a, I want to make sure that my test database, I can go debug afterwards. I don't have a bazillion things in there over months of a project. So it just resets before, in this case, I just reset it before each test run. That does oh, mean okay. though, my tests have to be much smarter about their assertions. If yes. I, <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so a good example would be like something that searches. Um, mm-hmm. So this is one oh. that like searches a set of stuff, and uh, yep. so I'll, I'll do. I'll be like, make sure that the count is greater than or equal to two, because I inserted two things in there, um, mm-hmm. and make sure that I pull the IDs out of the search results, and that the mm-hmm. you know this could be fifty things based on all the tests of this test run, but they should yeah. at least contain two IDs that I'm working from. So you do have to kind of adjust your assertions, but I find like this is this is much more robust into like mm-hmm. a real test I would run, which mm-hmm. is like I want those to be in the list. I don't care about the others necessarily, but those two should definitely be in that list, the ones that I just inserted. Okay, fantastic. That makes complete sense. The approach I've been taking as has been to reset the database before each test. And I thought, yeah, that's great. I have a clean history before each test. I don't have to worry. If the test fails, I can see the data in the database, and that, and that's wonderful. But yeah, they do run a little bit slower, and I, I just couldn't wrap my head around how are you running these in parallel? And now I understand. <laughs> so the yeah, reset it, happens as part of initialization. Yep. It took us, uh, it took my teams probably three or four years to just like bite the bullet and say, okay, look, Especially in our projects that are a bit bigger, um, you know, every single endpoint is going to have at least one of these integration tests. Um, mm-hmm. So if you start adding those up, that's going to be pretty slow. So some of our bigger apps, they could take ten minutes for these to run. So by parallelizing yeah. them, that's like okay, that's much that's much more reasonable. But your tests have to be a bit more a bit smarter now. They start like if you just assume yeah. the test the database is empty, like that's easy yeah. mode, right? Just like yeah, yeah, that's Done super deal. easy. Here it's uh, a bit yeah. A bit more challenging, but you know, still possible. So when we talk about um, writing our tests, so we talk about global data and tests for using global data. You're not doing that here. You have global data that could be accessed, but you're actually setting up all of your data at the beginning of the test, and then you're asserting in a very careful way on the on the expected results. So that's a great exactly. approach. And there's uh, there are some cases where there's uh, kind of static lookup data. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, do, I would do that as part of my fixture setup. It's like, well, there's you know ch- data that doesn't change. I'll go ahead and insert that at the beginning, um, mm-hmm. so that it's you know it it could be referenced out from the rest of the application. Okay, 
And so that's where we have the the tables to ignore and schema to ignore settings that we can configure. Is that right? Yeah. So if I go back up to here, whenever I instantiated uh, right here, um, instantiated mm -hmm. this stuff, uh, there were some a few other things in here. Uh, I'd zoom, but zooming for some reason is broken on my laptop. That's okay. <laughs> but so we have both included exclude lists for tables yeah. and schemas. And a good example okay. over here is uh, all these tables at the top. So we're using database migrations. Mm -hmm. And those are in a special schema, and I'm just I don't want those to get wiped because that's that messes up my my schema, uh, my, my my database migrations. So don't touch those. Um, so mm -hmm. in there, I would just say you know schemas to exclude uh, round round house. No, no, it's a weird mm -hmm. looking yeah something like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it has those uh, various other things that people have have contributed over the years. Um, temporal mm -hmm. tables uh, to ignore those because those can mess up things sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. The reseed stuff. Uh, so post some databases, you can basically reset your um, identity columns. Uh, okay. And so you can say, like, go ahead and reset those. So I have a known set of identity columns every time I reset the database. Okay, that's interesting. And so is that something that's built into SQL Server as well? Can we call that with our SQL Server DBs if we wanted to? Maybe. Uh, so <laughs> one of the challenges is like some databases have different ways to do things. So yeah, uh, at least this API is very simple. It's just like everything's at the top level and those parameters mm -hmm. should make sense for you based on your, your database that, that you use. Mm -hmm. so like temporal tables is really only supported for SQL Server, not for other yeah. table, other databases. Yeah. Okay, excellent. And is there any features that you're thinking about building into Respawn? Is there anything that's come up that the team has kind of said, oh, we really need to get this in there? Yes. Uh, right now, the let me bump up the size. Mm -hmm. um, it's net standard, but it's it's depending on system data SQL client. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next major version, we're going to be moving over to the, the, the new .NET Core version of this, which I think is like Microsoft.data, that SQL mm -hmm. client. Which is which is a truly cross-platform uh, SQL client that would work, uh, yeah, would would work anywhere basically. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're looking for that for the next go round to kind of leave the old packages in this version and going forward, you know, they'll still target yeah. that standard too, but just the the yeah. newer APIs that you know EF Core uses things like that. Okay, wonderful. And um, listen, I understand with these open source projects that you build, you have this code that you'll, you know, you'll start out with just this code and you're moving it from one project to the next, copying it around, and then eventually you get sick of doing that and you build an open source project. Is there any code that you're copying around right now that we should know about? Anything uh, coming up? Gosh. <laughs> I've, I've, okay. Yes, there was, but I just made a bunch of other open source projects. <laughs> <laughs> to help with that. So I was doing the distributed tracing stuff. So I've got a bunch of oh, packages yes. dealing with diagnostics and distributed tracing um, okay. for, for exactly that. So yeah, these downloads are <laughs> in the hundreds, <laughs> um, but they were mission critical for my clients to be able to see their entire flow from end to end. So I've got mm -hmm. MongoDB with distributed tracing built in now, uh, messaging yeah. within service bus. So I can see, uh, see everything. Uh, this mm -hmm. is my favorite mm -hmm. one. Niancat, that just launches the Niancat browser. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that yesterday and I clicked on it. I'm like, what is this? And then I, I clicked on the project site and it just takes me to the Nyan Cat site. And I'm like, I don't know what's happening here. I have to look at the source code. Uh, if, you, if you install it, it will just launch the browser because I saw you could execute random PowerShell scripts. So I thought, really? <laughs> Nyan Cat. <laughs> perfect, perfect. All right. Um, and have you got anything coming up that you would like to share with us? Um, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I just pushed out a bunch of distributed tracing. So I hope you all enjoy that video that will come out sometime in the next month or so. Yeah, wonderful. Okay. Well, thanks, Jimmy, to, for joining us today. And thanks, everyone, for joining us at this AMA at NDC Sydney. Um, obviously, we're all virtual, so be sure to hit the Slack channels. Check out some of the upcoming talks. There's a lot of great talks today. And enjoy the rest of your NDC Sydney experience. Thank you.